United Church minister in Toronto. He's also an atheist. Sound confusing or impossible? Wait until you hear our conversation. First, though, come back now. Brenda Bosper is a minister at Toronto's West Hill United Church. Ordained in the 90s, her leadership was welcome. She seemed a good fit for a church known to be open to the changing wars of the time. The United Church ordained women before others. This thing I marry. It welcomed gay marriage. But over the years, Bosper started to push for more change. She published books with titles like With or Without God. Her Twitter handle makes her purpose clear, irritating the church into the 21st century. I have met hundreds of Christians for whom the question of the existence of our God is anything but definitively answered. When she ditched readings of the Lord's Prayer, half her congregation left. Then, after the Charlotte Hebdo attacks, done in the name of an all-powerful God, Bosper went further. I'm Greta Bosper, and I'm a minister in the United Church of Canada who's actually out as an atheist. For some in her church, that was too much. The Toronto Conference of the United Church announced plans to review whether she's fit to be a minister. And now, she's fighting for her future. So far, the legal battle has cost her $60,000. I sat down with Greta Bosper at her church. So nice to meet you. It is very nice to meet you. Welcome to West Hill. On your Twitter feed, there's a quote mm -hmm. um, that says that you are irritating the church into the 21st century. You did a pretty good job, really. <laughs> Thank Why did you put that in there? Uh, because the church uh, that I grew up in um, was on a trajectory of evolution, and I was really excited about that. But it seemed to get scared uh, in the late 60s uh, and into the 70s, and it seemed to start pulling back a bit, all of which creates this, this idea that there is this being that is, to whom we are offering our praise and our worship. For many people, outside of a liberal mainline denomination, I don't think they really have a clear understanding of how deeply infused in our theology is the idea that God is not a theistic being, is not a supernatural you know, daddy who gives you things that you pray for. Um, I. I, I, that idea of God is so absent in our theological colleges. And so you wanted to stir things up again? Well, I, think that, I think that our evolution has to, has to be in our form as well. It's not just in our, it's not just the packaging. It's not just bringing in big screens and bands and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's about what the product is. What is the product? What are we doing? What is church about? What is church about for you? Well, for me, uh, church is about the long, the ultimate end of it is is creating healthy communities. Um, people who are in churches are out in communities, engaged in meaningful ways, and sharing the values that they have grown to engage and and commit to living out within a smaller community like a church. They're doing those out in the community, so it enriches relationships, it builds civic engagement. There's been a lot of attention on you. How many how many other ministers in the United Church are like you? <laughs> well, I couldn't say. Um, I don't I don't know. There are members. There are United Church clergy who are members of the Clergy Project, which is an, a network for clergy who no longer believe, but it's a it's a highly confidential group of people for obvious reasons. Um, but I think that, uh, I know that the principal of Emmanuel College felt that it would be at least upwards of 50% of the clergy in the United Church who don't believe in a theistic supernatural God. I was in a Facebook back and forth with one of my colleagues uh, the other day, and um, I made a remark about, you know, that God that, you know, that I, that I don't believe in, that no one else says they believe in, and he, and, uh, because people are regularly saying that to me. And he said, I don't know anyone who believes in the God you don't believe in. And he's a clergy person. This is within the United Church. Within it? the United Church. So he doesn't know anyone who believes in that kind of God. Um, but he pursues a God presence, is the way he puts it. So his pursuit of a God presence. So why are you in trouble then? 
if there's well, so many people like you in the church. Well, and that's part of that's part of the crazy about this because ten years, um, fifteen years into this, I certainly didn't think that I would be isolated in this work. I assumed that my colleagues would be with me in this work, would recognize the importance of this work, would realize that the language that we use is a huge barrier to participation, that our beliefs, I mean, at theological college, I was taught to explore the concept of God, and I was taught to wrestle with the Bible as a construction of a number of human, you know, people with human foibles and human, you know, interests, and that's how we addressed that book. I don't think anyone ever said to me, <clears throat> excuse me, this is not the authoritative word of God for all time. Nobody said that to me, but we were treating it as a human construction. So why aren't there more like you who are public? You can't talk about this stuff down here because you're threatening people's worldviews. Well, we've grown up. We're not that we're not that fragile anymore. Like we can talk about these things. Facebook, it's all over Facebook, it's all over the internet. People are having these conversations. Why do we have to pretend that they can't deal with the difficult conversation? You know, God, as source of goodness, as, and as the way that goodness comes into the world, and as the promise that everything's going to be good in the end, whether in this lifetime or the afterlife, that God doesn't exist anymore. And we have to recognize that we're the only way that goodness is going to get into this world. And we define what's good. What's good in one community won't be good in another. We define it, so we're the creators of good. And we have to we have to deal with the fact, we have to be responsible about the reality that we can't promise that goodness will out. We have the potential for goodness, but we can't promise it. And now it looks as though you're thinking that a church might be trying to stop you. Yes, that's true. That's challenging. Because it's the end of, I mean, that's, this is my United Church. I grew up in this church. I crossed, ran out my backyard and crossed the street to go to church as a kid. I, I got confirmed in the United Church. I taught confirmation classes when I was at university. I engaged. Um, and then I went back to theological college um, as a single mom to, to do this work. And because I believed in my church. Um, so what's going to happen now? What if what if they don't want you? What if they decide that you're not fit to be a minister here? Well, I'll be really sad that my fitness for ministry is based entirely on whether or not I can affirm an archaic uh, doctrinal statement that describes God in a way that is incomprehensible and no longer has meaning for me or many uh, within the United Church. Um, so that would, that would be sad. Um, and I, and I, as I've said elsewhere, I, I will feel betrayed by the church um, because it has created who I am. It has been a major force in my life. It has taught me what I know. It has given me the tools to explore. It has demanded that I do that. And so I've done that, and here we are. Can you win? I don't think there's winning in this situation at all. I don't think anyone's going to win in this situation. Um, I think that there are voices that are very opposed to my being in the United Church of Canada, and there are voices that are uh, very mm -hmm. opposed to the fact that I'm being reviewed. So the United Church, I mean, there were six people in a room, four of whom could vote, who decided to review me. And those four people have set this denomination on a path from which I don't think it can recover. It. Um, there's no graceful exit from this. Um, the conversation which I have wanted to have and which has been stimulated by my presence in the church for over 10 years, that conversation is, that conversation will continue to go on, but I don't think it'll be a healing conversation anymore. I think it's going to be a divisive conversation, and I don't think it needed to be that. You've obviously decided not to stop talking about it. <laughs> That's true. Um, 
because I'm really, I'm committed to these people uh, who, many of whom wouldn't be in the space if we weren't talking and doing things the way that we do them. They would have little interest in it. But here, we have in this room people who come here so that they can get the the inspiration, the encouragement, the strength, the interaction with people that allows them to go out into their lives and make a difference, to be present to someone that they never thought they'd be able to be present to, to undertake a volunteer challenge that they would never have thought, to change their work and take a new job because they feel compelled by a vision that we can be more than we are and that we can we can be better with one another and and these people these people don't need to be told that they're not members of the United Church of Canada and they will not feel members of the United Church of Canada if I am asked to leave because you're not changing no you're going to keep irritating the church yeah I guess so it's so interesting thank, thank you very thank much thank you so much thank you as you heard, coming up, a Canadian.